Hello, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, and also thanks to the organizers uh, for um, accepting my proposal for this talk on ableism. I'm very happy to be here. This is such a great event. I was here in 2016 and I was very inspired by uh, the intersectionality conference uh, which was held then. So um, this is um, an overview of my talk. Uh, it's roughly in two parts, and the first part will be about intersections and interconnectedness of ableism and speciesism, and how this operates within a system of oppression. So that first part is a little bit more theoretical, so um, please bear with me, but I think it's important to give an understanding of why I feel it's important to address these issues at a vegan conference, at a vegan festival. And then in the second part, I will give some more concrete examples and points to take into account to be an inclusive movement with respect to ableism. Um, so this talk is inspired by my own personal experiences of living with autoimmune diseases for um, three decades and my involvement in animal rights and vegan activism in one way or another for two decades, for 20 years. So, and it's also informed by theories of oppression, literature on animal rights and disability studies. But I want to note in advance that I'm certainly not a disability scholar. And for me, this is also finding my way in many different theories on disability. And so exploring all of these topics has raised many questions for me as well. Um, and I really don't pretend to have all the answers on them. Um, and this has been a journey of exploration for me too. So that is also the biggest purpose of this talk, so that you, that you, um, that you will consider the interconnections between different sorts of oppression, including ableism, and that you will recognize examples of ableism, and that you will acknowledge the need for diversity and inclusion, and inclusion in the movement. So um, classically, I start with some with a definition of ableism. So here are two definitions: um, discrimination and prejudice against disabled people in favor of those considered to be able-bodied, or another definition: the practices and dominant attitudes in society that devalue and limit the potential of persons with disabilities. It's a set of practices and beliefs that assign inferior value or worth to people who have developmental, emotional, physical, or psychiatric disabilities. So in the first definition, it says um, those considered to be abled-bodied. Uh, but who is actually seen as abled or who is actually considered as disabled? So here are some examples to make a point. On the left you have a cat in a wheelchair and on the right you have the cats with a flat face. They are called the brachycephalic cats and they often have breathing problems. Uh, they have been bred so far that their face is so flat. They also often have eye inflammation, skin infections and difficulty eating. And on the, on the left you see the cat who was shot, who was paralyzed, who was given a wheelchair. Now in the classic perception, we will, we will consider the cat on the left to be a disabil disabled cat, but we won't think of the cat on the right to, uh, on the right to be uh, disabled cats. But you could really see them as disabled cats. A similar example is from, uh, with cows. On the left you see a cow, who, uh, that was cow hero in the United States, and because of frostbite he had part of his hind legs removed, amputated, and he was given prosthetic legs. Uh, and on the, on the right we see the famous uh, Belgian blue, and that's uh, unfortunately an example from my country, who, uh, who have been bred, who have been naturally selection. It's natural selection. This is not the result of hormones or, or medication or anything. These cows are born this way. They have been naturally selected for double musling. musling. Um, so in a lot of cases, these Belgian blues, they cannot give birth naturally. They need a cesarean section. They also have joint problems, of course, because of the large body mass. And the, the cows have really large tongues and that can cause drinking problems. So here again, who do we consider as disabled? So the definition of ableism, it talks about the discrimination of people with disabilities, but it did not say anything about who falls into the category of who is considered disabled and who is not considered disabled. And so generally in, in disability theory, um, uh, it is said that disabled is then the interaction between functional limitation on the one hand 
and on the other hand, an environment that does not take into account these differences or limitation. Um, so it's uh, on the one hand the medical mo model of disability, uh, which puts the focus on the individual. The individual needs to integrate, the individual needs to put in an effort to adapt. Versus on the other hand, the social model of disability, which states that society needs to adapt and society needs to provide accessible spaces and facilities. So the social model, if we think about the social model, it would be that um, if society would provide enough um, accessibility of buildings and would be accessible in, e in everything, there wouldn't be any disabled people because everything would be uh, accessible. And I'm not talking only about wheelchair accessibility, but accessibility on many different levels as well. I'll talk about that uh, in the examples. So, um, Without denying the real physical or psychological differences uh, between people and the impact on their lives, it is important to realize that disability or ability is partly a social construction and who is considered as disabled or abled that varies according to time, place and also varies culturally. And this is an example uh, to make a point. That's uh, uh, the detail of a painting from Pieter Breugel, the fight between Carnival and Lentas from the 16th century. And you see uh, disabled people. Um, so being disabled in the Middle Ages versus being disabled now, the same type of disability is a whole difference of how you can live uh, as a person. Now, about the intersections between speciesism and ableism. So other animals are discriminated because they belong to a different species than ours. So that's called speciesism. But with disabled animals, there's an added layer of discrimination because of, this, of their disabilities, of course. So that's where ableism and speciesism intersect. And this is an example of um, um, the fact that older and disabled animal companions have a lesser chance of getting adopted. So they face a much greater chance of being killed or uh, as euphemistically is called euthanized than younger and able-bodied animal companions because of course it's difficult to find adopters for them. Nobody wants a disabled animal, an animal companion. And also because yeah, it can entail a lot of unknown veterinary costs. Uh, that's not only the case for animal companions, uh, but also a lot of animals don't even show up um, in animal factory farming or in slaughter statistics. Um, a, a lot of disabled animals don't show up uh, in those statistics because disabled animals are immediately killed after birth um, or they are killed when getting disabilities or sick later on in life or they are just neglected and left to die, which happens, for example, with broiler chickens who are left to die on the farm floor. So this, this is not only the case for farmed animals, but also, like I said, for animal companions. Um, they cost too much, they need too much care. For animals used in experiments, um, Disabled animals could distort the experiment results, of course, so disabled animals are also of no use uh, in experiments. For animals in zoos and in entertainment, because nobody wants to go see a, a crippled lion or a three-legged lion in the zoo. And uh, with respect to animals in the wild, from an ecological point of view, uh, injured or disabled animals, wild animals are valued less um, if they cannot survive in the wild anymore. But fortunately, um, some disabled animals are fortunate to be rescued and spend their lives at sanctuaries. This, was an ex this is an example of Edgar's mission. That's a sanctuary in the United States. Um, that's sheep 64. Uh, he is blind, but he gets around with the help of another sheep who's carrying a bell. And he also has a metal halo, which warns him when, whenever he's about to bump into uh, something. Um, on another level, there are also overlapping oppressions, ableism and speciesism, where they overlap with, uh, with each other. And we see how the speciesist system also has health consequences for humans. Uh, so, for example, the impact of factory farming on, on the environment and on human health. Uh, think of water pollution and air pollution near uh, factory farms, which causes health problems for the people living in the vicinity of factory farms. Also, the development of resistant bacteria, which poses a huge uh, health, uh, world health problem, uh, and of viruses, uh, flu viruses that come from factory farming. 
So that can be life-threatening for humans. Uh, and also uh, an aspect that is of often overlooked is the psychological and physical toll on slaughterhouse workers. So the system depends on cheap labor and it exploits not only, hu uh, not only animals, the speciesist side, but also humans. So the point I would like to make here is that in fact all oppressions, uh, so like ableism, speciesism, but also racism, sexism and classism, they are interconnected and they sometimes overlap, like I gave some examples. But these oppressions, they do not simple, simply intersect or are connected or overlap, but they operate in the same way and they use the same tactics of objectification, of animalization, of devaluation and of putting the blame for problems on the others. And many of these aspects were also touched upon, were also talked about by the speech that Carol Adams just gave uh, in the auditorium, if you were there. So um, this, this fits into the Western way of thinking that categorizes the world in binaries or dualisms in which one end is always valued higher than the other. So male against and above female, human against and above other animals, whites against people of color, rational against and above emotional, and so forth, as you see on the slide. So belonging to a category on the left or on the right side means benefiting from privilege or respectively being in the oppressed group. And belonging to several oppressed groups at the same time adds, of course, another layer to the oppression. Um, so, for example, disabled people and themselves are already more at risk of being physically, sexually, psychologically and financially abused, and they are more vulnerable to neglect. And this is then even more the case when they are women, when they are people of color, when they are LGBTQ, when they are older or when they are poor, or even when it's a combination of all of these, it makes it much worse. So the categories in, in one side also get linked together. Uh, think of how men are thought of as more rational and women are often categorized as more emotional. Uh, and of course, rational is seen as better than emotional. Uh, people of color are seen as closer to nature and animal-like. And this also applies to disabled people. For example, calling disabled people animal names, seeing them as animals. And this is an example from uh, in the 19th century. This was Julia Pastrana, and she was referred to as, uh, as the ape woman, as the baboon woman, as the bear woman. And uh, she took part in the so-called freak shows. And she died at a very early age. She was only 26, a couple of days after having a baby, and the baby also died. And that was in 1860, um, and her body was embalmed, and even after when she was dead, she was embalmed, her baby was also embalmed, and even for several decades after, her body was taken on tour and uh, as a part of these uh, freak shows. Um, and this, um, this was in the same period and often took place together with the tours of animal menageries, so the zoos, which traveled with exotic animals across the United States and Europe. Um, so that's an example, that was an exhibit, the, the poster is, that's an exhibit uh, that was in, uh, in Belgium last year and that was in Paris a couple of years ago, which gave um, uh, an, an overview of all of these uh, animal zoos that appeared, um, sorry, I apologize, uh, of all of the human zoos that um, traveled across Europe and the United States in the 19th century and well into the 20th century. So as I said, um, uh, these uh, humans were put on display just as animals were put on display. So this is an illustration, so uh, just as disabled uh, people were put on display. So this is an illustration of the interconnectedness between ableism, sexism, speciesism and racism. So another note on the interconnectedness of ableism and speciesism is that ableism is strongly connected to speciesism. Uh, speciesism is in say ableism because it is discrimination of other animals because they do not possess certain abilities. So throughout history several abilities have been the demarcation line to give moral status to some and to deny it to others. So being able to speak, being able to reason, eyes that face forward, walking on two legs, 
Um, so this also had implications for the humans who do not possess those abilities. So people who, who cannot speak, who cannot see, who cannot reason. So they were or they're still, they still are uh, uh, seen as less than human, as more animal-like. And disabled people often were also seen as the missing link between animals and humans. And if you would like to read more about those issues, I strongly recommend the book. You see the book over there of Sonora Taylor, Beasts of Burden, which really goes into that matter uh, in detail. That's a very interesting book. Um, these isms, so all of these oppressions, sexism, racism, ableism, ageism, are often seen as individual prejudice, uh, as individual, disc individual discriminations or biases. But in fact, they are ideologies developed to enforce a system of oppression. And discriminating against disabled people is often portrayed by the system as the natural way of things. So this can also explain um, uh, one of the central notions of ableism and also ageism, ageism um, that their bodies and minds, or the bodies and minds of disabled people are, are deemed as not productive, not useful, not marketable. They are of no use in a system that is centered around production and profit. And this also applies to speciesism, of course. And they are often easy culprits for everything that goes wrong in society. They are blamed for economic and social challenges. So ableism is often institutionalized. And here are a couple of examples of institutionalized ableism. Uh, for example, the healthcare system or the insurance. So many people are excluded from uh, insurance, from health insurance on the basis of abilities or if they have a pre-existing condition. There was something in the 19th century uh, and that was in the United States and it was called the ugly laws. Um, there were laws in certain US cities banning disabled people from public spaces. Uh, with visible disabilities, so that was not really for aesthetic reasons, because they were not uh, pretty to look at, but it was actually a means of the state of controlling disabled people, having a means, having a legal means to be able to arrest them and to put them in institutions, to be able to control them. And it's also um, happened in the same period when, uh, uh, when we had the eugenetics ideas, when we also had the forced sterilization of disabled people, which still happens in a lot of countries. Um, um, also other examples of institutionalized ableism, of course, the killing of disabled people during the Holocaust and um, medical experiments on disabled people, which happened also in the Second World War in a lot of instances. Um, Uh, so, as I said, all of these oppressions are not only individual prejudices, but ideologies to support and legitimize the oppression of women, of disabled, of older people, and all of them are seen as others. And institutionalized ableism can also explain the existence of internalized ableism. So when people who have disabilities themselves uh, show uh, ableist attitudes or prejudice, um, that is when people think, disabled people then think they are of no value, that they are not good enough, that they have nothing to contribute or are redundant because the system makes them internalize ableism. So what is the source of the system of oppression? Now some authors stress one aspect more than the other and for me, uh, being, form, being informed by aspects from ecofeminism, environmental justice, also intersectionality theory, uh, social justice. I see it as a mixture of uh, capitalism, colonialism and patriarchy, patriarchy uh, a combination of all of these reinforcing one another. So the point I would actually want to make with these is that activism should not only be about changing individual behavior because there is so much emphasis on just focusing on changing individual behavior, but it should also, we should also take into account that we have to dismantle the system of oppression. And that, of course, includes being aware of all the connections between the different isms, between all of these different discriminations uh, and oppressions. And tackling just one of these oppressions, just if we only focus on speciesism in itself, without taking into account all the other oppressions, without taking into account sexism, racism, ageism, and of course also ableism. So while we are colluding with the system, that will just not work. So that was a, uh, the main point that I wanted to make um, with this first part. 
Now, to make it more concrete, how to be an inclusive movement. Now, inclusion, of course, not only refers to, to ableism, but I will give some points, of course, about um, um, being a more inclusive movement with respect to uh, ableist issues. Um, is there ableism and, uh, in the vegan and animal rights movement? Well, that's more of a rhetorical question because, yes, I think there is. That's also the reason why I wanted to give this talk here, this presentation here. Um, this is a, a slide, uh, this is a quote from uh, Collectively Free from an interview with Carol Adams. When we open a vegan brochure, we are most likely met with images of stereotypical, able-bodied, youthful, happy people who are usually also usually white and heteronormative. So there's many aspects together here, the, um, not only ableist issues, but also the sexism, the racism um, that's uh, present in our movement. So uh, when you go to festivals, when you uh, go to demonstrations, when you take part in, uh, in rallies, uh, in marches, when you look around, do you see diversity in the movement? Um, I see a very wide audience in front of me, so that's one aspect of uh, diversity that certainly even here at Vecfest, which is really an accessible um, event. So, those are things that we should take, uh, um, really think about. Uh, now I know, of course, disability is not always visible and other, um, other isms, it's not always visible on your face whether you are LGBTQ or whether you, whether you are disabled, I know that. But there is a lack of diversity in our movement. So um, here are some points to take into consideration. Um, listen to marginalized groups. So the approach of disabled people to veganism, to their questions and concerns, might be totally different than those of able-bodied people. So if possible, let them be actively involved in campaigns targeting their peers, and if possible, let them lead the campaigns. And I say if possible, because for some people with some disabilities, this might be more difficult. Don't just say, oh, veganism, that's easy, because that is not true for everyone. Um, it does not pay attention to the many oppressed or marginalized groups who do not have easy access to fresh food, to vegan products, to vegan services. Think of, for example, people who are institutionalized, people who, are, who spend their life in a care facility, people who are in hospital, or people who depend on others for, for just living, for shopping, for food that may not be so simple for them. People who depend on ready-made meals. If there are no vegan ready-made meals in your area, where you, uh, then it's not so, so easy for, um, for disabled people or for other people. About activism, uh, please stop shaming activists for not being present at rallies, demonstrations or other events. Those are comments that I see a lot of on social media. Uh, where were you? Uh, where are the activists? Uh, you should be an activist. You should come and join us on the street. But activism comes in so many forms and so many forms of activism are just not ment mentally or physically possible or accessible for some people. Uh, there is so much focus on street activism and people doing the most visible forms of activism are proclaimed the heroes of the movement. But there are so many invisible forms of activism too. Um, be aware that different types of activism appeal more or less to different people. The time, the place, the location of activism. So think about which types uh, of event will reach people with disabilities. Uh, an example, be aware that a potluck in the park, uh, which might involve sitting in the grass, may not be accessible for everyone. That doesn't mean you don't have to organize potlucks in the park anymore, but just be aware of that and maybe uh, provide some facilities for that. Be aware that difference between activities during the day, that there is a difference between activities during the day versus in the evening, which will appeal more, more or less to some people. And then, um, the body shaming in a movement. Um, body shaming uh, mostly comes down to fat shaming, so shaming people for being fat, and there's a lot of that going around, unfortunately, in the vegan movement. Um, vegans come in all sizes and shapes. Um, yes, on average, vegans do have a lower BMI, but that does not mean all vegans are thin and that all non-vegans are, are fat or have a, a more body weight. A vegan diet is also no guarantee for weight loss. So, as I told you in, in the beginning, I have several autoimmune diseases 
and my weight in the last couple, in the last 30 years, has yo-yoed up and down in a range of just as many kilos, so in a span of 30 kilos, so sometimes in a couple of months it's like 15 kilos up, and then in a couple of months it's like 10 kilos down, and yo-yo up and down, so that's been my story the last 30 years. Um, and the, para the, the ironic thing is that when I have size 36, um, when I actually only weigh like 50 kilos or something, uh, people come to me, oh, you look so good. But that's actually when I'm, when I'm really si sick, when I, have, when I have a flare. So always when I lose weight, people will can congratulate me on how good I look. Uh, but I, I, won't, I, I don't want to lose any weight. When I, when I go on the scale and I see that it's dropping a couple of kilos, I'm actually, no, 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 don't go that road. I, I want to keep my weight. So there's no one-to-one -one relationship between health and, and uh, your body size uh, that doesn't always apply so being skinny or thin does not automatically automatically mean that one is healthy or that one is more healthy than people with a higher BMI so there is no one-to-one -one causal relation with respect to weight and many diseases so the, here are a couple of examples about uh, of body shaming in the movement I'm sure you've seen some of them circulate on the um, on social media, uh, for example, the Santorini donkeys, that picture of that lady uh, has been doing the rounds for years, and actually that's not a picture of in, um, in Santorini, but it was from in, in Jordan, I believe, but it's always, uh, it's often used, that picture. When you put out a picture like that for an, an animal rights uh, campaign, it doesn't put the focus on animal rights, but it puts the focus on, on the fat people. And you will immediately also have a lot of fat shaming comments that follow, of course. Oh, look at the fat, uh, she should get her ass off and blah, blah. But it, we, we don't think about the animal rights issue anymore. And it, uh, the message that you give is, oh, if just the fat people don't ride the donkeys anymore, then the problem is solved. If it's just the thin, the thin people that ride the donkeys, oh, then the problem uh, is solved. But that should not be our message, we should focus on the animal rights message and say that we should stop the donkey rights thin people fat people all people we shouldn't be riding donkeys um, any anyway so I have a, a couple of examples I'm sure you've seen some of them and it's always uh, portraying the non-vegans as being fat and and making them the laughing stock um, On the left it says, but some that can't be healthy, and then on the right, a fierce carnivore on top of the food chain devouring its prey. Another example. Um, those on the bottom, you can just as well eat, eat those vegan, you know, a vegan hamburger, vegan fries, vegan uh, 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 drinks. And this is an example that um, those types of examples all also come up a lot. Um, it, it frames uh, Westerners, um, non-vegans then, they, they portray them as non-vegans, bigger people against malnourished people, uh, often Africans, black people. But here again, um, the issues with this are that not all non-vegans are thick or fat and eating vegan is no guarantee for losing weight. And even if all Westerners, if we all would adopt a vegan diet, there would still be famine and also food shortage for many people because of the capitalist system and how food distribution is organized, how wealth is accumulated in the hands of some. So we, vegan, um, we, all of us, vegans and non-vegans, we are all to blame for famine in other places of the world. Because we depend on cheap raw materials to make all our products, because we exploit them with cheap labor, and yes, also because we steal their crops, not only to feed animals, but also to feed ourselves. Even as vegans, we import a lot of food from those areas in, in the world. So the, the problems with body shaming, with fat shaming, is that it marginalizes fat vegans. It makes them feel unwelcome in the movement. And also it's not effective. Uh, body shaming is not only not effective, but it's also even counterproductive because it can even be damaging to mental health. Um, it can contribute to the development of eating disorders. It gives people a negative self-image and it, drops to self, uh, it adds to dropped self-esteem. So the core message that I would like to have, give is focus on the animal rights issue, not on singling out people because of their appearance. So I have a quote here. It's, it's not my quote, but I think it, it was such a good quote. Being vegan is what is in our hearts, not is what is in our hips. Uh, I think that was very fitting. Uh, 
Uh, related to that is uh, health shaming. Uh, health shaming is shaming people about their health status. Um, so veganism, uh, veganism is often presented as a miracle cure for all health problems. Oh, go vegan and all your health problems will be solved. Um, and if you are not healthy, okay, well, that's probably because you're not doing it right. It must be something that you uh, not do not do right. Because normally, yeah, if you go vegan, it should be solved. Yeah. But there are so many other factors that determine one's health. Not only diet plays a part, but also lifestyle, environmental factors of where you live. Think of, for example, air pollution, water pollution, radiation, genetics. And often there is no one-to-one -one link between any of these and a health status. So I'm certainly not denying that a vegan diet and certainly a whole foods plant-based diet is generally beneficial to one's health and it can reduce the risk for many chronic diseases uh, for conditions and illnesses. So vegans are less likely to have uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, they are less likely to have hypertension, they are less likely to develop certain cancers. So I'm certainly not denying that, but there is no guarantee even vegans can get cancer, even vegans get cancer, and even vegans die. Um, so this is, uh, maybe you've heard of these books, um, that's How Not to Die on the one hand, uh, which stresses the, the health advantages, and then on the other side, even vegans die uh, from Carol Adams and other authors, who, who stresses that we should be careful with the health shaming, that it's not so a straightforward one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. And sometimes there's also damage, for example, because of a chronic or progressive disease that cannot be reversed with a vegan diet. So also like with body shaming, chronic health shaming has proven to work counterproductive, possibly leading to depression, weight gain and also addiction. So it can actually make people's health worse rather than motivate them to live a better lifestyle. And this also contributes to the idea that chronically ill vegans, that they are not good vegans. Uh, that they are not good enough to stand on the barricades for veganism, that they are not good ambassadors of veganism. Because if you don't fulfill the stereotypical image of beauty, of being young and of being healthy, you could scare people away, you know. Uh, we should be careful with putting you on, on the cover of a magazine because, you, have, you know, you're not really... You are not a good poster girl or boy for veganism. So th this was another example of a, of a meme that I saw doing the rounds, which I think is health shaming because um, vegans do sometimes need a cardiologist, you know, and um, that memes like that could also uh, reinforce, uh, could also give the idea to vegans um, thinking maybe when they develop certain symptoms, and they, they don't think about going to a doctor because they think, well, I'm vegan, there can't be anything wrong with me. And they delay going to a doctor, but actually there can be something wrong with them. We are not immune to diseases. So um, being chronically ill myself, I have never really felt comfortable about opening up about my diseases in the vegan or animal rights community. And I know from fellow vegans who are chronically ill that they have had similar feelings because of the health shaming in the movement. So it's like I often, I feel like kind of sandwiched in between, yeah, you could call them spheres of social interaction, I, I don't know. On the one hand, I sometimes feel outcasted from the vegan or animal rights movement who portrays veganism as a miracle cure for all diseases and as such alienates chronically ill vegans. So if it is such a miracle cure, I must not be doing it right, right? On the other hand, I can also read the judgment in the heads of non-vegans when I tell them I am vegan. Then they look up, you're vegan, but you're not healthy, how can I? And they will pinpoint my illness to not eating animals, of course. My veganism is to blame for not being healthy. And they say then, oh, but you would be cured if you just eat normal, if you eat animal products. Yeah? And then also, on the other hand, when the issue of diet is raised in support groups uh, for chronically ill people, I, I'm really ambiguous about suggesting veganism as a diet. Do I mention it or not? Um, do I also add that veganism is not a miracle cure? Uh, because if it is such a miracle cure, how come I am still not cured? So uh, I, I don't feel comfortable in any of these about opening up about my, my condition and, and the intersection with veganism. It's difficult for me. Um, another point to take into account, uh, to be a, an inclusive movement, points of ableism that we should take about uh, is the conflicting message 
uh, concerning healthy food that is often going around in the vegan movement. So on the one hand, you, um, we are advertising veganism as a, as a healthy message. Um, and then the next day, um, organizations will put out a message and be excited about, oh, there's a new vegan burger, and we have new vegan cheese and chocolate and ice cream and all the, well, unhealthy foods, you know, that's a really conflicting message. And I must admit, uh, I've done it myself. I run a couple of pages on Facebook, and I will sometimes share articles that, of course, there is a health benefit of uh, uh, following a vegan diet, but then the next day, I, I also will be excited about vegan cheese and all the um, less healthy foods, but that can be very conflicting for people, you know, because then they will, can try, they will per perhaps try all, the, all of these new foods and be excited about it, but that won't bring the, the supposed health benefits that goes with a whole food plant-based diet. The pseudoscientific health advice that runs rampant in the vegan community, you know, the coconut, uh, the coconut oil cures everything. I am sure you've, uh, you've seen uh, advices like that. Um, also wishing bad health to non-vegans, uh, celebrating their death and illness. I, I, I think this is horrible. This was an example from last summer. There was a British woman who died on holiday in Greece after she ate um, uh, chicken and she had food poisoning. And I think the next day already she was dead. And the comments that I saw uh, on, on, on that in vegan groups uh, was just horrible. And then I think, what if our family and our friends and so read this stuff, will they, will they be inspired to come join our movement, to try veganism, to... Um, I don't think so, I, I think it was really horrible. Um, I'm sorry about uh, the horrible photo, but it is to make a point. Um, it's about the use of medication, and I will explain. So this is a photo of a hand with frostbite. And now the treatment of frostbite is to gradually reheat the affected body parts with uh, lukewarm water, so water between 37 degrees Celsius, Celsius and 45 degrees Celsius. And we previously thought that the treatment of frostbite was to rub uh, the body parts that were effective. But we don't do that anymore, we gradually reheat them with lukewarm water. So how do we know that? Um, because of uh, vivisection experiments, that were performed in a Japanese uh, prison camp during World War II. And that was called, that was Unit 371. So, and they had a lot of Chinese prisoners, civilians, and they also had prisoners of war. And they performed a lot of vivisection experiments on them. And with vivisection, I mean really vivisection. I read up a, a lot of the experiments that they did and it was really, really horrible. And for example, a frostbite, they put them outside in freezing temperatures to see at what temperature the limbs would freeze off, whether they, if they saw them off, whether they, there would be still bloodstream and everything. So really horrible, I, I spare you uh, other details. So that's how we know that what the treatment, the best treatment of frostbite now is. So throughout history, there have been several medical experiments on humans on which science has built. So we now have a body of knowledge because of those unethical experiments on humans. So I, I am as much against experiments on humans as I am against such experiments on other animals, violating both humans and animal rights. But that knowledge from the past cannot be unknown. We cannot unknow the knowledge that we gained from those experiments, both from experiments on animals and on humans. We cannot undo the knowledge that has developed out of those experiments. So using or not using medication will in no way change the future. It does not alter the requirement for animal testing, which is mandatory by law. So even if we as vegans all decide to stop taking medication, that will not change the fact that animal experiments will still continue. That is different, for example, for cosmetics, because for cosmetics, there are, of, of course, alternatives who are not tested, and we have a choice to buy products that are not tested. So I think we should focus on changing the legislation and developing alternatives and not on shaming vegans who do take medication. And, and meditation, medication is sometimes really necessary as a therapy. Another point to take into account is uh, ableist language. Yes, ableist language that does exist. There is um, racist language, there is sexist language, and there's also uh, ableist language. 
So use language that is respectful to disabled people. Some examples are words like, oh, he's so retarded, oh, that was so lame, oh, that's insane. You idiot, he's such an idiot, oh, that's a loony. She's so autistic, crippled, spaz. So those are a couple of uh, examples. And related to that are microaggressions or little jokes. Uh, now, microaggressions or little jokes are not really discrimination or prejudice in themselves, but you could, for example, compare them to a mosquito bite. When you have like one mosquito bite a day, it won't really bother you, but when you have 20 or 30 in a day, day after day after day after day, then that becomes really bothersome. So that's a bit similar with the microaggressions. And this is, those are all examples from a lady that occasionally uses a wheelchair, and that's the same for me, so I can relate a lot to what she says. I think it's too small for you to read, but um, an example is, for example, um, uh, but, you, but you can walk, right? I saw you move your legs. Uh, but you can stand up to get there. No, you, you can walk. Um, or um, when I'm in the way, uh, people move my chair without telling me. So that those are just little things, you know, that make it really annoying. Um, about uh, accessibility. Um, uh, think about the accessibility of events, of demonstrations, of actions, uh, festivals, but um, don't think about... Um, a lot of people immediately think about wheelchair accessibility, but there's a lot more to it. Um, also provide image descriptions, subtitles, transcripts, uh, uh, with respect to the format of the media that you use, be aware that not everyone can listen to podcasts, can actually see or read blogs, can see the photos. So add image descriptions, add subtitles to your videos, add transcripts. Um, if possible, provide translations uh, also in, in sign language. Um, and just as important, I think, is provide information about accessibility. When you organize an event, uh, provide information uh, upfront about the accessibility. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing so annoying when I want to go to an event and I have to ask every time, again and again and again, is, there, is it wheelchair accessible? Are there any stairs? Is there a wheelchair accessible toilet? Um, and things like that. Just put the information on your website and put a person there who is responsible that we can, that we can contact. Even if it is not accessible, just say it. There, there's, there are three steps, there are five steps, that's on the first floor. So don't, then, then people know what to expect, and then we don't, don't have the attitude, oh, we're just going to wait and see if somebody asks about uh, accessibility, and then we're going to think about it, and then we're going to provide something. The, don't have that attitude. Think about it in advance. Uh, how are you going to deal with it? And, and put the information out there. Um, this is uh, about inclusiveness. There was a, uh, an example to show um, the non-representation in popular culture of disabled people. Um, for example, in movies, in Disney movies, there was a, a person who made a cartoon to make the point that disabled people are often missing in, in movies. And also, um, in, in the movies, um, disabled people are often played by able-bodied actors. And think about also how the villains or the bad guys are often portrayed as having visible disabilities, uh, you know, the one-eyed or one-legged pirate. Mm. Um, but inclusiveness uh, is, of course, more than just diversity. Uh, it's not because some person with a disability participates in an event or is a member of your organization that the event or organization is truly diverse or is inclusive. So also, don't use people with disabilities or older people uh, as tokens in campaigns or on images. Now I'm going to round up. Um, okay. Um, so why is it important to address um, why is it important to address ableism? Um, this, it still mentions ageism as well, but it's also important uh, for ageism. Uh, for effective activism, so as a movement, um, we must of course try to reach everyone in society. We must build bridges, and if people don't feel welcome in our movement, uh, we're missing out on a whole group of people, of course. So that's the effectiveness uh, issue. But of course, I, it's not only about being effective. Um, for me, the core of the message is that the animal rights movement is, of course, a justice movement. Uh, ableism goes against the principle of fairness and compassion for all. So I would like to end with a...
with a quote um, from um, Audre Lorde. She was a black feminist writer and feminist activist. And although she did not specifically address speciesism, I feel it's very appropriate here, as it underlines the interconnectedness of all oppressions, uh, and goes like this. Uh, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. So racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, and other forms of oppression and discrimination are the master's tools, and so is speciesism. And if we want to bring down the speciesist house, we cannot do so by using oppressive tools of discrimination based on age, gender, race, sexual orientation, or abilities. And I think it's, uh, I feel it's high time that the movement does some introspection on all of these issues. Thank you. Okay, there's still uh, um, a couple of more minutes left. If, um, if anybody has a, a question, I'm open for questions. So if you see me at the, at the festival here, you can also come to me and, and come speak to me. Uh. Hello. Um, I think one of the problems, um, you know, is um, that, you know, when you try and raise problems like racism or, you know, other questions like that, you often get shut down by other vegans. Um, this has happened to me quite a few times. You know, you get shut down. They don't want yes. to do it. There's often a backlash as well. I mean, um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, the Vegan Society UK, they uh, published a list. Of, this is just a banal example. I mean, it's so ridiculous. Um, a list of uh, 100 black vegans. So you think, okay, that's good. I mean, it's, it's not, you know. So 100 black vegans with people like Angela Davis and other people who were Yeah, I remember so that. And the interesting thing was the backlash afterwards, the white backlash. So these white vegans were posting um, messages of protest saying, oh, how dare you do that? You know, I mean, you should just... Uh, um, treat everyone like vegans. So, so the minute you say something positive about black people, even if it's just very simple and banal, there's a, a backlash. So yeah, it's I, interesting, even from white vegans. Yeah, uh, I understand completely and I remember that example that you raised and that's why I think it's important to keep raising our voices and to keep... Uh, that's also one of the reasons why I wanted to give this presentation here and I'm... I'm very happy that uh, um, VegFest UK is open to presentations like that because not all festivals, not all vegan events would be welcoming to uh, having um, presentations and talks about uh, the interconnectedness of these oppressions that we should combat racism, sexism, ableism and so forth. So uh, yeah, the only thing I can say is just keep keep uh, raising our voices and going in against it. I have a feeling like it's like it's has gotten so much worse the last 10, 15 years. Our movement has, has gone away from what it was in the, more in the 80s and the 90s. It, it, it has always been a movement of compassion and of justice for all. And now I feel like there are so many voices now saying, well, but we should only focus on the animals and it's just about the animals and all the rest, all the other discriminations. And we shouldn't be taking, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about human rights. That doesn't matter. We should focus on the animals, but that we cannot uh, take them apart. They, they belong together. They are interconnected. Um, <laughs> I think there has to be um, a really deliberate um, attempt to get, you know, to um, to give a voice, you know, to those people. I mean, I guess the vegan movement just reflects mainstream society. So in a way, you know, you can't really, uh, you know, it's difficult to get with conditioning. For yeah, and we have to keep trying and doing it. Yeah, yeah. white people. Are, but, you know, another example, just very quickly, and this was just not nothing to do with veganism. Do you remember when Trump obnoxiously, he's always obnoxious, but he, <laughs> he, oh, um, he um, made fun of, of the disabled, disabled journalist. journalist. Yeah, that so, was horrible. But, yeah. but afterwards, um, on uh, American TV, well, I guess CNN, so I was watching CNN, so they were talking about it very indignantly, they were saying, well, Trump, but they did not have a disabled person to represent. Yeah. To say, why not? Why were they all able bodied journalists? Mm. Um, why didn't they have, uh, I mean, I can understand that probably that, that journalist in question didn't want to be exposed, you know, he was already, he'd already been locked, but why didn't they invite a disabled person on 
to uh, uh, you know give voice to disabled. Yeah, that's a very pertinent I mean, uh, remark. Yeah. yeah, of course. So uh, mm -hmm. just taking people, so that's just. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, it was really nice to be here. Thank you again. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.